Hi, so what is going to happen in this video? Well, this video is about correlation and regression, where in particular it's going to focus on correlation, but but let me just build up into how we got here or why we're here. The course began by introducing you to data, and in particular, one column of data. And so with that one column, whether it's age or height or circumference, whatever it might be, whatever is being measured, you learned how to visualize it with a graph, and you learned how to summarize it with some sort of number, number or numerical value. But that is visualizing and summarizing a single column of data. And then you did some statistical inference where you learned how to create a confidence interval or do a hypothesis test. But now we're going up one level and we're pretending that we have two columns of data and we're going through the whole process over again. And so we're starting with, well, how do you summarize the relationship between two columns of data with a numerical value? And how do you visualize the relationship between those two variables with some sort of graph? So the visualization is going to be with a scatter plot, or some of you may know it as an XY plot. Scatter plot is more common, and so that's the, uh, the terminology that I tend to use. And then the numerical summary for today is going to be the correlation or the correlation coefficient, which is R, the little r, <clears throat> and that is our numerical summary. So again, this video is going to focus on how do you compute this numerical summary R? which is again, the correlation coefficient, and it's also known as Pearson's R. Some of the objectives, you are going to learn how to visualize the relationship between two variables, describe the association. Eventually in the next video, you'll be able to determine the best fit line, which is the regression line, and to use that model for making predictions and extrapolations. The formula, <clears throat> or at least the version of the formula that I like to use the most, I've got on the top here, and that is going to be the sum of the product of x times y. So for each, imagine you've got two columns, two variables, and you've got many rows, the same number of rows in each variable. And so you're going to go row by row, multiply the x times y, x times y, x times y, and then that new column of products you're going to add together, and that gives you this top right summation here, or sorry, top left. From that summation, you're going to subtract n times the product of the sample means. And then when you have that numerator, you divide by n minus 1 and also divide by the two standard deviations. That's going to give you a little r value. There's a few ways of identifying whether you might have a, an appropriate value. One is that R has to be between plus and minus one, and that's always going to hold. And so R must be equal to or between plus and minus one. So if you are 1.3, there's a calculation error, or likewise, if you're more negative than negative one, something has gone wrong. What else? R is most appropriate if you have a linear relationship. So when you eventually create a scatter plot, if the relationship doesn't look linear, then it's, even though it could be found, it's not necessarily appropriate. We're not going to learn other measures of correlation in this class, but it's good to be aware of its strengths and weaknesses. So R should be equal to or between plus and minus one, and you should use it to depict a linear relationship between two variables. Now, R is going to be either positive or negative can be zero, but usually not. And the sign indicates the direction of the relationship. So when R is positive, it means that as one variable goes up, so does the other. When R is negative, it means they go in opposite directions. So as one increases, the other decreases. And so the way that you could describe each of these relationships, when R is positive, it means a positive or increasing or direct relationship. You don't have to say all three terms, but they all mean the same thing. Whereas if it's a negative sign, it implies a negative, an indirect or decreasing relationship. And again, you only need one of those terms, but it's good to know that you've got options. The strength of the relationship though, is determined by r squared. So you want to look at the square of your correlation coefficient. 
And that's in the middle here. That's called the coefficient of determination. R squared, if it's really large, if it's above 0.7, then you have a strong relationship. If it's below 0.3, it's weak. Excuse me, if it's in between, then it's moderate. If it's close to the border, there is flexibility. So if you had, let's say, 0.68, you don't have to say moderate, although that's fine. You could say moderately strong. If it's, you know, 0.32, you might say moderately weak. And so you can play a little bit in terms of, of your language, but but this boxed out area just gives you a general guideline for how to know whether it's weak, moderate, or strong. And again, that is based on R squared, the correlation, um, the coefficient of determination. <clears throat> now the coefficient of determination does have an additional use, which I've underlined there in red, and it could be interpreted. Other than giving the strength of the linear relationship, it also depicts the percentage of the variability in your Y variable that is explained by the x variable. And so that is a fixed phrase that you're going to want to come to know. Let's get to applying this or first see what the graphs might look like for different r values. And so here I've sketched just a handful of scatter plots. And you could see some increasing and some decreasing ones. For the top left one, for figure one here, here you have an increasing relationship as one goes up, the other goes down, or sorry, as one goes up, the other also goes up. And the values are relatively close to the line. So here, this might correspond to a correlation coefficient of 0.8. <clears throat> Whereas for figure two here, the values are further from the line. So it should be a smaller, closer to zero value but it's also a decreasing relationship. And so in that case, R should be some negative number. In this case, it might be negative 0.4. In problem or graph three, in this case, you have an increasing relationship and notice that the points are perfectly on the line. And so this would be the case when R is one. Likewise, if the line flips and it's decreasing and all the points are exactly on the line, that would be when R is negative one. Figure four shows an unusual scenario. And here you've got um, what looks like a perfect circle, you know, filled in circle. It's called a cloud or a random cloud. When you have this instance where it's hard to tell whether the perfect line should go this way or this way or should it be you know in this direction when you have that scenario this is when r is really close to zero there's essentially no relationship between x and y and then finally figure five <laughs> here again you can use correlation but it's not necessarily appropriate. And so in this instance, you can see that the relationship between X and Y is not linear. In fact, it looks more parabolic. I'm not gonna teach you how to model a, uh, a parabolic um, curve to this, but if you were to fit some sort of linear model, it might look like that blue line there. And so it looks like there's a general increasing trend and the points aren't necessarily very close to the line. And so it might be um, a value like 0.3. So that just gives you an idea that if you create the scatter plot first, what type of value might you be anticipating R to be like? Should it be positive? Should it be negative? Should it be really small, close to zero, or pretty large, close to plus or minus one? Well, let's actually get to applying this. We'll take a look at the first example here. And it says some students finish exams early and rest or turn it in, and others will check it or use the full amount of time to take the test. Have you ever wondered what grades these students get? Are the students that finish first and rest or turn it in in the best, turn it in the best in the class, or are they simply giving up? And so this was an actual investigation that I did. I was curious if, uh, if the best students tend to know their stuff, they finish fast and they just turn it in, or do they know their stuff, but they do it quickly and then they spend time to check, maybe even you know triple check themselves. Um, I wasn't really sure of the answer. 
And so here is a subsample of what I got. 10 students were recently observed in an exam and their grade and the amount of time that they spent on the test were recorded. The data are summarized in this table below. <clears throat> so part A asks us to calculate the Pearson correlation between time and grade. And the first thing that I would want to do, and for correlation, this isn't required, but it's good practice to, uh, to get used to doing it because it will be important for the next topic of regression. But the first thing I'd want to think about is, well, which variable is X and which is Y? And the way that you determine that is that Y is the variable that you believe is determined by or predicted from X. In this case, you ask yourself, well, do I think someone's grade may be based on the time they took to take the assessment or do i feel that the time they take is predicted from their grade and so there's a variety of ways you could reason this through but in my mind i would think well use time first and the grade comes second so the grade would be predicted from time so i would have grade as my y variable and time as my x variable which is what i've labeled at the top there now that i have that and I could see <clears throat> that the mean and the variance are given in the bottom here. Normally, if they aren't, I'd have to calculate those, but they're given in this one, and so I could progress on. So I want the Pearson correlation. So that means we are using this formula at the top. I have n of x bar and y bar. n is just the number of pairs, which is 10. I have S squared for each, but I could square root to get the bottom terms, the standard deviations. And so what I wanna focus on is this top left piece here, the sum of the product of X times Y. I described that earlier as multiplying <laughs> row by row. So the first row would be 54 times 75, and that gives 4,050. The second row is 38 times 91, which gives 3,458. And if you continue on, you should get the, the rest of those values that I've got there. And we want to add those up. And so when you add up the sum of those products, you've got this fairly big number of 41,790. And that goes in the top left part of that formula. And here, is the rest of that work? And so 41,790 is in the top left. N is 10, 49.9 and 84.6 are the two sample means. It doesn't matter the order that you multiply. N minus one is gonna be nine. And then I'm taking the square root again because those are variances and we want standard deviations. And so when you compute this, you should get negative 0.703. negative 0.703. <clears throat> and if you square it, which you don't need for part A, that's going to give you 0.494. So remember, you want to square, not square root that. So we're going to need that for part B. Part A, it's just asking us for to calculate R, which we just did. Now we move on to part B, and B says, describe the relationship between time and grade. Describe the relationship. Well, R is negative, so we know that there's a negative or decreasing relationship, and R squared is between 0.3 and 0.7. It's, it's pretty close to the middle, 0.5. So, so that tells us it's moderate. So we have a moderate decreasing relationship between time and grade. What does this mean? Well, the question there is asking us to, to figure out, do the students that finish first tend to get the highest grade? Well, if it's decreasing, that means as one goes up, the other goes down. So as students spend more time on the assessment, their grade got worse, is what this is saying. And so here, here that is that info written there's a moderate decreasing relationship. And what this means is that as a student spends more time or longer on the test, that their grade actually went down. <clears throat> so that's kind of suggesting that the weaker students tend to stay longer. Um, and that's just what happened in that class when I did this. 
All right, let's go through one more here. Take a look at number two. We're going to skip part C because, again, that corresponds to regression. That's going to be in the next video. And so number two says, in economic theory, the price of an item is often determined by the demand for that item. I underline that because that is giving you the idea of which should be X and which should be Y. Price is determined by demand. And so because of that, I would say that price is Y and demand is X. You could view it the other way, but based on how this is phrased, um, that's the, uh, the relationship that I'm looking for. So if many people want an iPad, then it may be sold at a higher price. So if demand is high, they might be able to get more money for it. Likewise, when it's less desirable, then it'll sell for less. And the following is the data set for the price and demand of the product. So you've got six observations here. And part A asks for us to find R squared and to interpret it. So again, first things that we want, we are going to want to get our X times Y. And this is now column by column, just by the way the data are organized. And so 252 times two is 504 and so on. And when you add all those up and compute your correlation coefficient, you should end up getting negative 0.995. Now I did end up going through first and getting, oops, sorry, getting the mean and the variances for each. And so I did end up getting that. So if you weren't sure where 2.5, 0.14, 237.33 and so forth were coming from, I computed the means and variances first for this. And so once I got that, I end up plugging into the formula and I get negative 0.995. Squaring that gives me 0.99. And so what does this mean? Well, now we want to interpret the coefficient of determination, not interpret the relationship between price and demand. This is different from the previous interpretation in the, in the last problem. And so this implies that 99% of the variability in price was explained by the X variable demand. That's the interpretation of R squared, which is what part A was looking for here. And B and C both correspond to regression. Again, that'll be reserved for the next video. At this point, I'd like for you to pause the video and attempt to do the correlation part of problem three. When you are ready, start the video back up. All right, let's see how it went. All right, so over here, I have revealed some of the information. You can see the means and the variances below. If you report the standard deviations on your, your own work, you could just square root these to, uh, to check. And you could see my products to get the sum of the X times Y. When you put all these together and you have N equals six observations, you should get an R value of about 0.21. Now, if you're pretty far off from this, <clears throat> or if you're a little off, it's probably due to rounding. Even though I write values like 7.33 and 66.83, when I actually calculate, I do put a whole bunch more threes in there. So 66.8333333 and 7.33333333. So I am a bit more precise than how I'm writing it here. So that's that may um, explain it. But if any of your numbers are further off, then there's probably a, a calculation issue going on. 0 0.21 is pretty small. And when you square that, you get 0.04. So this is implying that there's a negligible relationship. It's a, it is small, weak, positive. And so there is a weak positive relationship between one's height and their perceived physical attractiveness is what this data is saying. For the next class or next video, like I said, that's going to focus on regression. So all those um, lines that you saw on the scatter plots earlier, which I eyeballed and put on there, we are going to figure out how do we find the equation of those lines. With that, till then, see you next time.